try to pull the shades because I can't see. It should be at least a little better for me. I want to go over one or two things today, depending on the time. <coughs> I'm going to start out talking about dates. And then I want to get into interfaces. So let's look. I had this out there for a while, and you're welcome to take a look at it, of course. But Today, I want to actually go over it. All right, Java dates and fun with dates. We're going to look at go look at the first one, which is a tutorial about Java dates. And I think some of the examples that I covered are going to be in here, but it's a good reference to look at dates. The other thing I want to look at is I want to look at the Java docs. And consider the Java docs to be more or less the official documentation. You'll notice it's from Oracle's website. And you know consider this to be like the authoritative word on classes. And this shows you a lot of information. This shows you the package that it's contained in. A package is a way of grouping together Java classes. You will need to import certain classes. So that tells you the name of the package. Uh, this tells you what it inherits from. All right, so this inherits from Java Lang object. Everything. Every class there is inherits from Java Lang object. All right. Uh, all the implementable, all the implemented interfaces, and we'll talk about interfaces uh, later today, or uh, if not today, the next time. And again, what this does is it shows a description. It shows what apps exist. Uh, these are the stats attributes, local date, min and max. That's the lowest and the earliest date that you can have. So you can go up to 1231 this year, which is quite a long time in the future. It's not quite like the Y2K bug. They also have a list of methods that you can call. So if you want to know what you can do on a date, this is the place to go. Details of the fields, details of the methods. These take a little bit of time to read and can be a little tricky, especially when you have a lot of inheritance. Because there might exist a method on a class, but it's not defined on that class, it's defined on the ancestor. So you might have to trace through a bunch of ancestors to find all the methods that you you want to see all right but it's good to learn and start getting used to uh, reviewing Java Docs because that's like the authoritative word on a class all right tutorials are good because usually tutorials come with examples and 
they, they give you a little bit more narrative on when you would use this or when you would use that. So tutorials are good as far as a learning tool, but to like get the, the real uncut definition of the contents of a class, Javadocs is the way to go. Okay, so I took a variety of examples and so I sort of uh, put them all together in this one little thing called fun with dates and we'll review this and we'll play around with it a little bit. Whoops. Okay, so here is the one class that you get that I created. Let's open it up in Notepad and let's view it. First of all, notice we are importing several classes here. Have I gone over what, the, what import means? Why do we import classes? We import classes because different classes live in different packages. Classes in Java are organized according to package. Uh, in, in, according to package. And some objects are just, you know, if we look at string, for example, Anything within Java Lang, the Java compiler automatically knows what you're referring to. So you don't have to import Java Lang string. So anything within that Java Lang package, you don't have to specify. Everything else you do. And the reason that you have to specify it is there's a potential for there to be more than one class with the same name. All right? And the example I give that's kind of meant, it, it's, it's not really contrived, it's a real example, is let's say you worked at a furniture store, all right? And your furniture store, one of the items they sell, is, they sell are tables, okay? So you might have a table class in your application that relates to tables, the four-legged things that you put stuff on top of, all right? Dinner tables and kitchen tables and, and those kind of tables. But you may also have interactive database in your application. So you might also be dealing with database tables. So within a given application, it's possible, because different people work on different classes, that you end up with two classes called tables. And you have to say which one you're using, right? You have to specify, well, hey, when I say tables in this program, I mean a database table. When I say tables in this program, I mean the wooden things with four legs, OK? So you identify that by putting the package in. So in this case, I say Java time local date. That is telling the compiler that the Local date, when I say local date here, what I mean is the local date class that's found in the Java time package. I don't mean some other local date class that could be elsewhere. All right? I mean the one that lives in this package. You don't have one set. Oh, go ahead. In this example, you do because I do, I do a bunch of different things, all right? So to, if you're just doing local date, you probably just need this first one. But if you're doing some of the other things that I'm doing, you would need the other ones. Um, actually, to be honest, maybe I don't need all of them. Maybe I just put them in just for good measure. It doesn't hurt. 
It's interesting, too, because it's not like it, some people think it like pulls, when, when I first saw this, I thought it meant it like pulls code in from these places. It really doesn't. It just points to them. It just says, hey, here's where you find the local date. If you don't do that, you don't have to do that. But then you have to put in, every time you refer to the class, the full name of the class, including the package name. So, if I didn't import local date, I still use that class simply by saying, every time I refer to local date, saying java.time.localDate. All right? The problem with that is that's a drag, right? I mean, why would you want to type that in every single time? So you put the import on the top, say, this is where I'm talking about, this is where that class lives, and then refer to it by the class name. Okay? If you happen to have two classes with the same name that live in different packages and you want to use them in the same program, you'd import one and the other one you'd put in the package name completely. It's probably a pretty rare occurrence, but if it happened, that's how you'd handle it. So that's what it means when you import. All right. Our fun with dates is just a class as a main. First, couple lines are used to create a date that uh, corresponds to the current moment in time. All right? So this shows, this would create a date of whatever today is, October 9th? Yeah, I think. Yeah. All right. Another thing we can do is we can call a different function to create a date given a month, a day, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a year, a month, and a day. So that one will create it using 2016 as the year, 7 as the month, and 4 as the day. It's 4th of July. Now, you might notice something a little odd about this. This this function, this is a different way of creating an object than we've used in the past. All right? How is it different? What are we not referencing here? How have we created objects in the past? We've said local date something equals what? New local date. Well, no. Dot now is this is calling a method on the local date class. It is what's called a static method. Have I talked about static methods before? Static methods are defined on the class, not defined on the object. Most methods that we call, we call on the object. All right? Like, I have this until method. Until. All right? I say object dot name of the function, and then I pass the arguments. This one, I don't have the name of the object. I have the name of the class. That's because, again, that is a static method. You do not require an object. You can call that method on the class. Now, dot now is a method that creates a date object that holds the current date is different than a constructor, but the effect is the same. This is a little object factory, this function. This function makes objects, just as this function makes objects. So if we look at Java docs for local date,
we will see one of the methods, and we can ask for static methods. One of them is now. All right. Now, static method, which means we don't have to have an instance of the class, which kind of the paradox, right? It, you, you, it wouldn't make sense if you needed an instance of the class to make an instance of the class. But you can call this function on the class, not on the object, and it will output a local date object. Why do you do this this way instead of with constructors? I can't give you a good answer for that. All right? It's just a different way to do it. Likewise, there is an of method, which we also use to create a date object with a given year, month, and day. Year, month, and day. Now here, we're using a stack variable in the month class called July. That is the number of, that's just a different way to refer to the month number for July, to say month.july. That is a static uh, variable. It's not defined for every object. July is July regardless of what month, what month object you're talking about. So we have three ways of creating dates. I want to comment on thing from 33 on because I just want to focus on the first few parts of code. All right. I create three dates. That's October 9th. This is 4th of July. This one is 4th of July, right? So day two and day three both have 4th of July in them. All right? So let's save this and compile it and check out the results. So I compile it, and I run it, and I look, there's the first date with today's date, there's my two July 4th uh, dates, yet it tells me they are not equal, All right? That might seem like a bit of a mystery to you, because they both are, are July 4th. Why wouldn't they be equal? They're both the same date. They're not equal because of the way that object references are used in Java as compared to primitive variables. Okay? Now's as good a time as any is to talk about that difference in more detail. All right? So, if I have a primitive, <coughs> and I int x, int y, x equals 1, y equals 1, then I have f equals y. All right. Will this comparison be true or false? 
if I have two int variables called, one called x, one called y, I set both. if they're equal. Will that show up as being true or false? True, right? One equals one. All right. Here's exactly what the Java Virtual Machine does. Let's look inside the Java Virtual Machine and let, let's pretend we're the Java Virtual Machine. When I in X, I create a variable. There's two parts of memory. There's a stack and there's a heap. A stack relates. To, okay, my heart's working fine today. The stack to. this pretend function that I've written. So if I say x equals 1, or if I say int x, I set up a, a memory box, a memory location in memory precisely on the stack that's going to hold an integer. That's all I can put in there, right? If I try to put a string in there, I'll get an error. So when I create a variable like this, I say what can go in the variable. And in this case, I have two little boxes, one called x and one called y, and both of them can hold integers. So I put a 1 in x, and I put a 1 in y. So. This is what, if we were to be able to look inside the Java Virtual Machine, what would see? The memory location that's named x, wherever that is in memory, has a value of 1. The memory location named y also has a value of 1. When I say if x equals y, I'm comparing the value of those memory locations. Well, they're the same right? They both equal 1. So the memory location named x and the memory location named y have the same value. Then say if x equals y, it'll show up as being true. Now, let's look at the difference when we come to dates. If I local date D1 equals local date dot of 201674, then I local date D2 equals the exact thing, if I dates are equal, it's going to tell me no, they're not. That's what we saw when we ran the example before. Why is that? Well, it's the way that the data is stored in memory. And what is stored in a variable for an object compared to what is stored in a variable for a primitive. So, in this case, local date D1 equals local date of 2016-74. I have a variable on the stack named D1. And what I hold in there is a pointer to a local date. So I'll put P to LD. Pointer to a local date. 
when I get that local data object, it gets created somewhere called the heap. And it gets stored in some memory location on the heap with whatever value we've given to it. And then what gets stored in the variable is the pointer to the object. So what gets stored here is the memory location that this object was created in on the heap. And we'll just say for the fun of it that it gets stored in memory location 1000. This comes along does the same thing. I create a second date variable which is going to be a pointer to a local date. I create a new date object in the heap, some other memory location, and I put that memory location in the variable. So if I compare D1 equals D2, it's going to do the same thing that it did here. It's going to look at the contents of D1 and D2 and say, are they the same? The difference being is, in this case, the contents of D1 and D2 are the memory locations of where the object lives. Since they're different objects, they live in different memory locations. And therefore, this statement is going to turn out to be false. Okay, This is such an important distinction that it before, but I don't care if I talked about it before, because you can't emphasize this enough. All right, with an object, you store in the variable a memory location, a pointer. With a primitive, you store the actual value, because a primitive is simple, right? What is there about an integer? Just the value of the integer, so we can store that in a variable. What is there about a date, though? Well, a date has a bunch of properties. It has a month, a date, a year. It has functions. It has all kinds of things that you can do with a date. That's more complex. So we create the object in the heap, and we point to it through the variable. So when we're doing comparisons with classes and objects, the variables contain the pointer. So these two would only be, sh this would only show as being true if these two pointed to the same object. All right? So let's look back at it again. I create D2. I create D3. I've created two different objects. This creates an object. This creates an object. First object gets pointed to by my variable called date2. The second object gets pointed by my variable d3. Two different objects. Therefore, the pointers are different. So if I ask, are the variables the same, it looks to see, are the pointers the same? Do both of these variables point to the same object? And the answer is no. Therefore, it's going to display the dates are not equal. Now, how do you test to see if one date equals another date, though? You actually use the equals function. So you say date 2 dot equals and then date 3. Then look to see if they're the same object. It looks to see if the year, month, and date match. And if the year, month, and date match, they're considered to be equal. Okay. You have the same situation with strings, by the way. If you notice in the pizza example, where I compare to see if a string was, uh, if the size was small, if the size was S, I never said if size equals S. I said size dot equals S. So whenever you're comparing objects, if you want to compare the values of those objects, use the dot equals. If you want to use, if you want to compare to see if they are the same object, then you use the equal signs. 
So let's change this up real quick. If I were to do this, date 3 equals date 2. Are these going to show up as being, will this tell them as being equal or not? Guesses? It will show them up as being equal because what happens when we assign one object to another? Well, we assign the pointers. So in this case, if we did that that said D3 equals D2, we would take the first variable and put it in the second variable. So both of these variables would point to the same object. So it's one and the same object. So if we compared the values, we compared the pointers, the pointers are the same, so they're the literally pointing to the same object. And therefore it would show that they're equal. So, let's recompile. Now it shows they're equal, because they're literally the same object. So, be careful when you compare two object references together. Are you checking to see that they really point to the same object? If so, then you use this. If you want to see that they have the same values, verify that there's a dot equals function. Because not all classes have a dot equals function, but many of them do. Like string and date, they all do. Questions about that? Uh, equal, equal, is comparing. equal equals comparing. To, when you use equal equals to test between two object reference pointers, you're seeing if they are the same pointer. All right? If you use dot equals for dates, you're seeing if the two objects have the same month, day, and year. Okay? Same information stored within the object. Sure. Let's maybe. Uh huh. Yeah, it does. Because you could have two things that point to the same object. All right, you could have two things that point to the same object. So you could have multiple pointers that all point to the same object. All right. So nothing. And, and this isn't the question I thought you were going to ask, all right? So I'm going to answer your question, and I'm going to go answer the question I thought you were going to ask, all right? In this case, yeah, D2 is still there. It's just that they both point to this object. No, I guess I meant uh, date, too. I'm sorry. This one? Yeah. Uh, that's what I thought you were going to ask. Okay. What happens to the date that is at memory location 2000, because nothing points to it anymore. The cleanup will take care of it, right. Because this is, it's going to sound like a gangster movie, but this is dead to us, all right? Because there's no points to it. There's no way that we can get to that object anymore. So what garbage collection does is periodically it looks for any objects that exist in memory that nothing points to. And in this case, once I assign D, D1 to D2, once I say D2 equals D1, this guy is sort of orphaned out there. No one points to it, which means that it's useless to us. And as soon as garbage collection does its thing, which would be pretty quickly, that memory is freed up. 
It's a good thing that it, that it works this way, because in languages that don't have garbage collection, you have to keep track of that yourself. And if you mess up, you have what's called a memory leak, all right, where you have objects that are being created but not being destroyed, all right? And if objects are created and not being destroyed, eventually they start bogging down memory because it accumulates there, all right? Uh, whereas garbage collection should prevent that sort of memory leak from happening. In fact, let me Google to give a better definition of memory leak. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, strictly speaking, you can still have uh, memory leaks in Java if you keep objects around that you don't really need. So, it depends what you mean by memory leak. All right, your question, a stack overflow. A lot of times with a stack overflow, what a stack overflow would be is if you got in a, you got in sort of a recursive situation where function A calls function B, then function B calls function A again, all right? There's something called a stack in, in, uh, in programming, a concept called a stack. And the stack keeps track of what function calls have been made and lets you know where to return to. So let's talk about a, a simple stack where everything worked correctly. So let's say a B and it calls function C. So A calls B B calls C I was saying B and I have to be writing C. So B calls C and then C returns. Our stack tell us where to return to. So, let's say this is like the first function that we call. We get here, we call function B. We're going to put in the stack that you return back to function A. Because that when B finishes, you're going to return to function A. We get function B. Function B is going to put, is going to call function C, and it's going to put on the stack B, because after C finishes, that you return back to, to function B. We go to function C, and function C finishes, so returns. So where are we going to return to? We're going to return to function B. We remove it from the stack. What happens then when that is we Remove that stack back to function A. So the stack keeps track of where to return to. So if A calls B, it puts on the stack, hey, when you're done with B, go back to A. All right? When B calls C, it puts on the stack, when you're done with C, go back to B. And if you do everything correctly, that'll work out. So you'll call those functions, and then as you return, you'll go back up the stack to function B, then to function A. But let's say we had something that was messed up. 
Let's say we had something like this. Function A calls B function B calls back All right, what's our stack like? Well, and there's returns here and returns here. We get A, we call B. So we put out that, hey, when B finishes, go back to A. We get B, we call function A. So when A finishes, we're going to go back to B. We call function A again. We're going to put it back, and we're going to repeat that over and over because there's no end in sight. This is going to just repeat endlessly. At some point, there's not enough space in the stack to handle all those calls. All right? And that we have a stack overflow. I don't know the precise number, but at a certain point, you call function A, the calls function B, the calls function C, the calls function D. In a normal course operation, you're probably not going to ever have a stack overflow if you're calling things correctly and returning correctly. However, if you have a bug where something like calls back something that had previously been called, you're going to bounce back and forth and just be in a loop of adding those things in the stack and never taking anything out because you're never hitting the return. The return is what takes things off the stack. A function call puts things on the stack. So if you're never getting that return and you're always calling more functions, you're just going to keep putting things on and on and on in the stack and eventually it's not going to be able to handle it and you have a stack overflow. All right, That is a stack overflow. A buffer overflow is a little bit different. Let's Google that one. A buffer overflow relates to if you have, if you're like reading in like a stream or getting input from somewhere, if you get more data than you're expecting. Pardon me? More data than you can load. And more data that can load, more data that can handle. Uh, it's related a little bit different. These are often done for exploiting vulnerabilities in systems. A memory leak typically is a bug. All right? A buffer overflow is typically a problem that isn't handled correctly that allows itself to be exploited. All right? So it's a little bit different, but neither of them are good things to have. All right? OK. Let's go back to our fun with dates. And I have things in here. You can do date arithmetic. If you ever try to write date arithmetic yourself, like if you tried to store a date as three integers, a year, a month, and a date, it's real difficult, right? Because you have to know about like what happens during leap year. Leap year, there's 29 days in February. You have to know how many days are each in each month. It's not impossible, but it's a pain. It's nice that this is taken care of. So I can go and say, give me date 4 equals date 1 plus 28 days. So 28 days from the day would be what? It's October 9th, 28 days would be November 6th, I think. And so it will tell me November 6th. 
we can tell if a date is after another date by using this function. If date four is after date one, which it should be because it's 28 days after. We can see how many days are between two dates. We can see how many dates until a date. And so on. So now, now let's uncomment this out and rerun it and look at the last few results. Okay, so we go through here, we create our three dates. The dates are not equal because they're not the same object. 28 days after today is November 6th. Yes, that is after today. And either of these functions, how many days until from date one until date four, uh, I don't know why I did that twice, but it shows that there's 28 days. Or it also shows that there's 28 days between date one and date four. If you want to know more functions, go to the Java docs, and there'd be similar before. Just like there is, a, is after, there'd be a is, is before. All right. This should be enough because I think this lab and I think the next couple labs we're using dates on. All right. So that's all I had for today. We'll see you up in lab. Monday, we'll talk about interfaces.